MC Lobshire, the host of the Cash Ninja podcast and also the president and chief wealth and investment strategist of Producers Wealth, where we help our clients integrate cash flow banking, also known as infinite banking, with their business and investments. If you're interested in learning more about how we create strategies that integrate cash flow banking and investments to turbocharge them, you can access a video series at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. Welcome to the Cash Flow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Here is your host inside the dojo, MC Laubscher. Hello, Cash Flow Ninjas. MC Laubscher here. Welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today. And in today's show, we're going to look how you can capitalize on massive opportunities in the coming bear market. My guest in this episode is Kenneth Amaduri. Kenneth is the chief editor and co-founder of uh, the financial publication letter CrushTheStreet.com. He was a founder of Future Money Trends and Wealth Research Group, which have gone on to be vital sources of education and wealth for hundreds of thousands of readers. In his 20s, Kenneth founded multiple businesses that have gone on to be worth millions of dollars. He was also the founder of FMT Advisory, which successfully manages millions of dollars in clients' funds. He is an ardent student of Austrian economics and anticipating market trends as he has successfully invested and built companies for more than 15 years. Kenneth spends his time relentlessly analyzing resource tech and other sectors, uncovering areas in which equity can be captured and a profit can be made. Kenneth is passionate about sharing the lessons of success and failure that have led him to where he is today through his work published weekly at crushthestreet.com. Always excited to uh, speak with Kenneth. Kenneth has been a previous guest on the Cashflow Ninja and really looking forward to getting his take on what is currently happening in the stock markets uh, worldwide and also the global economy. If you're interested in joining our investors group, you can go to cashflowninja.com forward slash investors group and fill out an application form and or email me at info at cashflowninja.com to start the discussion to see if you're a good fit for our group. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the United States. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Learn how to find the best deals by downloading your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. Kenneth, welcome back to the show. Hello, sir. Thanks for having me back on. Appreciate it. Yeah, always great to connect with you. And boy, we are in some interesting times. So pretty excited to jump into our conversation and get your thoughts on a lot of the things that's happening uh, out in this, uh, this amazing world that we live in. Oh, yeah. Well, what an amazing time to be alive. This is my first uh, interview of 2019. So I'm super pumped right now. Uh, we're seeing a lot of sea changes. And I feel like we're at a tipping point of uh, quite a few trends, which is very exciting. Not so much in the middle of us of these trends, but like at, at an inflection point at a few of the different trends, which is really interesting uh, in and of itself. So absolutely. Uh, why don't we start, uh, if you don't mind giving us, uh, for new listeners, uh, you've been a previous guest on the show, would highly recommend new listeners go and check out uh, the past episode you did with us. But if you could just give us a little bit about and share a little bit about your background and journey. Well, uh, yes, thanks for that. I, I'm the chief editor of CrushTheStreet.com, founder of the Future Money Trends, co-founder of Future Money Trends. And I've always been interested in investing in finance. It's one of those things that goes back into my teenage years, uh, fascinated with business. And I think it really stemmed from my mom and dad. My dad was 
you know, a very frugal person, taught me to defer gratification, you know, question the government. And he taught me that, you know, business is the way to have financial freedom. Uh, and, you know, my mom really taught me to have passion. She's actually from Argentina and dealt with hyperinflation. So that's where a lot of my uh, libertarian gold sound money sort of philosophies have come from. And, you know, just that combination really had a put a fire under me to to get out there. And, you know, I was a successful best investor in my teenage years into my 20s. And, you know, that's when I started, you know, the Crush the Street website. I really wanted to start pouring into people, helping people opt out of conventional wisdom and be equipped with tools that could help them get ahead in their life. And, and that's what we've been doing at CrushTheStreet.com. And, you know, that's what I'll, my purpose is really for the rest of my life. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, and you, you do amazing work there. Would highly recommend folks check it out. Uh, you mentioned conventional wisdom and the herd mentality plays into that. And boy, is it a dangerous time to be a part of the herd. Not a, not a good year in the markets. What's your take on uh, the global markets and, and global economy? We ended up uh, with a little bit of a bloodbath in, in uh, December, and it seems like uh, <laughs> the bloodbath is continuing uh, here at the start of the new year. Yeah, well, what an interesting time. And, I, you know, historically, we've seen Decembers be very strong for stock markets. It's, you know, one of the strongest months of the year. And yet this was one of the worst Decembers we've seen since what the Great Depression, they're saying. Uh, it, it's been a, a shift, a major sea change, a turn of a dime. And it really goes back to interest rates starting to rise. I think that's the underlying culprit of this entire mess that we're seeing is is that we thought that we would have seen this correlation maybe back when the Fed started to raise interest rates, like an immediate reaction, but it, it's starting to to settle in now here at the end of 2018, you know, with the FANG stocks severely leading the markets downwards and then uh, everything else following. It's not so much of a correction that we're seeing now. I mean, we're over 20% now or we've seen a 20% correction in the markets. And that's a, that's a bear market environment. When you see that, you know that conventional wisdom is now you know, stopped in its place. People aren't as optimistic to dive in thinking that we're in this overall long-term secular bull market anymore. So uh, one thing I know is bear markets can be brutal. As much as you think that you know we've bottomed, a lot of times bear, uh, the markets have a way of washing and rinsing investors once again. And it's very important that people are paying attention to where we are right now in the stock market. And actually, I would encourage people, we wrote a special report for your audience at crushthestreet.com forward slash bear, uh, which actually goes over you know how we see this bear market playing out over the next few months and even years lots of stuff happening um just on the sideline too you mentioned interest rates and there's a there's a massive battle uh, between Pre president trump and the fed uh what's your take on wh what's going on there well i think it goes to show that president trump understands really what is what has driven this record long bull market you know if you recall uh you know we celebrated the 10th year of this or you know going on 10 years of this bull market of uh of stocks and uh you know it's this record long thing that he knew was unsustainable he called this whole thing a, a bubble during his campaign and now we're looking at the stock market and he's it's out of his hands it's out of his control so he's deflecting to the Fed. Well, hey, you know, when it's good, it's because of me, it's because of optimism, it's because of capital flowing back into the country. And then when everything goes to hell, oh, it's the damn Fed, right? right. Uh, and I think Trump is, you know, playing chess, three-dimensional chess with the entire presidency when it comes to the wall, when it comes to trade wars, when it comes to posturing, optimism. I mean, it, it was just a week ago. Trump was calling this a, a buying opportunity for the stock market. I mean, he was the, the a promoter. And the next day, of course, the stocks rebounded a thousand points or whatever it was. And uh, it's just such a crazy thing that we're seeing right now in the stock market. 
But it's, uh, I definitely for, see further downside risk here because we've gone up so much so fast based on artificial stimulus, these ultra low interest rates, which ultimately have to go up. So and when that does happen, I believe underlying assets are going to reflect that. And, you know, we're going to see the brutality of this bear continue to play itself out because I think we're in the early days of this recession. Absolutely. Yeah. It was interesting to see him pointing out the things that we talk about that's wrong with the economy, how it's uh, very much inflated and, and, and uh, bubbles are blowing up everywhere. And, and then he stepped in um, and he kind of took credit for it. So, I'm, you know, right now, as you mentioned, uh, he's deflecting a lot, uh, put it, putting it on the Fed. Um, and it's going to be interesting within this bear market because it's basically after taking credit for all of it going to be uh right right at his doorstep right yeah and it's crazy how much the stock market is is a barometer for the economy because even today uh you know mainstream numbers that there was strong jobs data that mm. came out and you know we have seen a lot of strong financial data in the markets but you know, there's only so much these markets can go up until ultimately things have to slow down. Asset prices have gotten out of control because of ultra low interest rates. And, you know, there's things about what Trump has done that I really like. I mean, you can't take away the good that, you know, lowering the tax rates has done for the economy, has made the country a more competitive place around the world, which attracts capital into the country, which is positive. That's a fundamentally positive thing. That's not, uh, you know, lowering interest rates type of stimulus or giving everybody a thousand dollar check. I mean, that's a, a fundamental attraction of capital into the country, which is, you know, take away everything else, a hundred percent good. Um, but, you know, when the S&P 500 was, you know, what, 2,700 and, and Dow Jones going up the way it has. I mean, we, we've seen these asset prices, which definitely need to correct. And I think we're in for a little bit of hurt, especially once these the, the pessimism starts to trickle into the jobs numbers, to employment, to consumer spending, and all of these things that have the ripple effect, which ultimately perpetuates more recession, more job loss. And I think a recession is on its way. And, you know, you throw in artificial intelligence, you throw in all the other things that are competing with jobs. It's going to be an interesting, you know, another few years. I would say the next three to four years are going to be a very interesting time. Interest rates and the Trump battle versus the, the Fed. If you're an international listener, and we've got a lot of listeners in, in South Africa, uh, the country of, of my birth, um, how does this affect you? Well, a lot of emerging economies have a lot of dollar-denominated debt. So when interest rates go up, now all of a sudden to, to finance this debt, the cost of that increases significantly. So a lot of emerging economies uh, might feel this, well, will feel this impact. Yeah, and it's interesting because it's almost like an odd dichotomy that you would assume that you know, the U.S. raising interest rates and, you know, more problems, you know, soon to set in into an unsustainable debt situation would cause the dollar to get stronger. But it's so ingrained around the world that the U.S. dollar is the safe haven. And as anytime we see stocks start to correct and this fear start to set in, we really see people go to the dollar, uh, which I think is a short term flight to safety because I don't believe that that's going to be the future of uh, future of where the safe haven is for you know decades and years to come I believe that we're gonna see money flow into real assets you know something that's limited and finite and, and useful like maybe precious metals real estate and uh, even something like Bitcoin which is a little more speculative but I, I like it a lot um, so it's, it's one of these things, uh, absolutely, you know, the world is dependent on the U S doing what it is, but there's going to be a massive global shakeup. And when countries that let's say China and India and Russia that are storing gold and preparing for that sea change to take place, that global sea change for the conventional macro economy that the world has depended on for years, kind of 
breaks apart, uh, it's going to be a lot of these countries that are that are paving the way to to go to the next level when this wealth shift takes place. And I and I believe it's going to happen from west to east in uh, very many ways here. So uh, that's what we're preparing for. And one of the things that you can do to be prepared for that is own hard assets, own finite uh, assets that will retain its purchasing power despite what the underlying fiat dollar is doing. How bad do you think it's going to to, to get and how quickly and how hard might this hit, hit people? Because uh, one of the reasons why I'm asking this I just actually uh, rewatched the movie The Big Short, <laughs> and if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend watching that movie because it's eerie the similarities of what's going on in the environment right now, uh, what happened before uh, a lot of stuff started to unfold in the movie. One of the stories that broke last year, maybe some folks saw it, maybe they did not, was Treasury Secretary Mnuchin holds calls with the CEOs of major banks. Now, uh, can you share a little bit why that is important and some of the things that you're seeing and how bad this, is, this, this could get? Absolutely. And I think that it was very bad optics for, you know, during December, we're seeing this stock market, you know, correction here. Uh, supposedly, everything's fine. The Fed is strong, feeling good about raising interest rates. And then as soon as we start seeing some, you know, boy flying off the handlebars, sort of out of control surroundings, atmosphere here, we see Mnuchin meet with the, the bankers, which was very reminiscent of the 08 problem we saw, which, as you pointed out with the big short, uh, very problematic. I mean, you know, years of unemployment, uh, asset prices getting cut in half by and more in many cases, uh, you know, suicides on Wall Street. I mean, just very, very crazy time uh, that was. And, and to even hint at any sort of possible reversion to that, I think was uh, unsettling for many people in the markets. And the thing that I would say in just the years that I've been investing is, you know, I believe something big and a big correction is going to take place, but it's not going to be like 2001 or, or 2008 or, or, you know, the 29 depression. It's going to be different. It may be, you know, to the same magnitude of the 08 crisis, uh, but it, I, I believe we're just going to see a di it play out differently. You know, whether it's going to be in the bond markets, whether it's going to be a combination of stocks crashing, real estate crashing. Um, we're in a different time. You know, the internet has come a long way. Uh, you know, the jobs are shifting largely. I mean, 10 years in, you know, 20, the 21st century versus 10 years in the 1800s, obviously things are moving at exponential speeds. So um, I would say that, you know, you need to be nimble. You, you can't just, you know, you can't just prepare like it's going to happen exactly like it happened in 08 or expect the stock markets to, you know, do exactly one specific thing because you don't know that. And so because of that, you need to be diversified in your investments. Um, you need to have precious metals. I would say own some stocks too, because the fact is, is if we do see a dollar crisis, which that might be the very thing that changes in this next crash, you know, that could be the variable that's different. I actually think that stocks will be to a certain degree a safe haven if we see the underlying dollar crash, you know, seriously devalued. So uh, keep that in mind, you know, when, it, when you think about just selling every single stock you might have, every single blue chip you might have because you're worried about a stock market crash. The flip side is it might be a dollar crash and these stocks should go up in relation to your dollars. So um, that's the hedge that I would give people. You know, same thing with real estate. Real estate could, you know, very well come down in price. But if we see a dollar crisis, real estate could be the hedge that protects you against that, you know, fleeting purchasing power with the U.S. dollar. So um, having said those things, I mean, just 
just really focus on being financially free. The debt problem is your number one concern. And then, you know, take it to the next level, be diversified where you're not too exposed to any one specific asset class and uh, own some gold. In this environment, you're definitely want to going to want to own some gold, especially as we're seeing some confirmed movements to the upside. You're listening to Kenneth Amaduri on the Cashflow Ninja podcast. We'll be right back afterward from our sponsors. Life settlement investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic, market, and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. And if you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments for a number of solutions at cashflowninja.com forward slash life settlements. You're listening to Kenneth Amaduri on the Cashflow Ninja podcast and I'm back to our interview. Yeah, it looks like they're definitely poised for breaking out gold and silver. Um, let's talk about crypto for a little bit. Very interesting <laughs> year it had in 2018 after that big, big uh, spike and basically the, uh, it had the, it coming out party, right? As of recording today, I just pulled it up on one of my apps here. What's it? 130 billion is the, the market cap for the crypto, which means Jeff Bezos basically <laughs> could buy, almost buy up the entire crypto market if he chose to, just to put it into perspective for folks. And also, uh, um, you know, we, we've got what uh, uh, a lot of millionaires around the world to not getting in. What, what, what do you see happening in crypto? What excites you there? What's the institutional play on there? Are they still interested? Are they putting trading desks together? As I saw a lot of these big banks started to do in, uh, on Wall Street. What, what, what do you see happening there? Yeah, what a wild ride we've seen. Uh, this is something that was close to my heart. I mean, we covered Bitcoin back when it was $11 and you know, we largely got in when it was $800 and we're very grateful to um, you know, what crypto has done monetarily for a lot of the readers that crush the street and you know, fortunately we sold a lot, you know, in that hyperbolic bull market. Uh, and we, we're buying back in. My goal is to have three times the nominal Bitcoins I had in 2017. Now, you know, now that we've seen this pullback where we're sub $4,000 Bitcoin. And I say that to imply my underlying belief and, you know, my long term belief in it that I think that Bitcoin and a lot of the other cryptos will ultimately go up. You know, Bitcoin as the benchmark will be $50,000, $100,000 one day. I think the future for it is still absolutely huge. We've seen some forks come out. You know, last year we had the Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin fork. And, you know, that fork actually added enthusiasm and, and market cap to the environment. Back in 2017, uh, the middle of the summer, you know, a lot of people were worried about it and it created excitement. But in the bear market, in the brutality of the bear market, you know, there was this Bitcoin cash hard fork. And, you know, for a lot of the people that are concerned about what was going on, the future of crypto, how bad can this get? I feel like that fork was a little more dilutive and confusing for the environment. But what I think is happening is a lot of people's attention and focus is filtering back to Bitcoin. A lot of these forks are, uh, you know, confusing the community. And the more the forks take place, the less power they have and the more people just kind of revert back to Bitcoin as the granddaddy of them all. And uh, that has so further solidified my belief that, you know, Bitcoin's first mover advantage and everything that's coming online for it are continuing to solidify themselves. And I do believe it is going to be some mainstream ETFs and you know, future tradings, derivatives that are con they're going to continue to add market cap and institutional money to the space to continue to legitimize it. I think it's gonna be a combination of the mainstream adoption and all of its just underlying use cases, like you know, someone in Venezuela watching their currency go to nothing, being able to move their wealth into Bitcoin, transfer it to Switzerland, 
you know, sell it there and have it. That's like a worst case scenario, really giving the people the autonomy that, you know, we want. We want to be able to opt out of the system. And Bitcoin offers that individual sovereignty, which is a very beautiful thing. Um, so as far as what we're seeing now, I mean, this is just a psychological learning time. I mean, how many people when we were going into the 2017 bull market, looking at Bitcoin, 10,000 then 15,000, we're just wanting to pile in and, you know, thinking, how could it ever go back to 3,000? You know, how could it ever happen with all this adoption, you know, mainstream media covering it? I mean, this thing's going destined for $100,000 and then to watch it go into this bear market and get really brutal. I mean, people can't really put their minds around how brutal a bear market can be. But, you know, if you start with some of the price action, oh, it's just a correction. Nobody sold. And then, you know, you get some bad news uh, and then which adds more of a correction. And then more bad news, bankruptcies. I mean, just now, just the fact that prices have come down so much, we're going to hear a lot of companies going bankrupt because they were dependent on much higher Ethereum prices, much higher Bitcoin prices. And, you know, this is going to weigh down on the community for an extended period of time. So I don't think we're going to see a reversal in the very near term here with with crypto because I think a lot of flushing out and washing out of the community needs to take place. But in this environment, it's a, it's a buying opportunity if you ask me. Yeah, if you look at mining costs too, what it costs to mine a Bitcoin, I mean, a lot of people have speculated and of some of the information that's available. It's around about $3,000, right? So there's, there's a lot of miners that have closed up shop. And the other thing that also add, uh, add to it from the, the in terms of volatility, small markets are very volatile. It's only 130 billion. As I jokingly said, Bezos could probably buy it up, right? Um, Absolutely. And, well, yeah. and here, it's an early, if I'll just jump in right there uh, real short. We have had only 10 years to uh, figure out the price of Bitcoin. You know, the crypto is still largely introducing itself to the world. I mean, gold has had, what, a couple thousand years for the world to figure out its price. And ultimately, I think gold is undervalued, but um, we have just barely scratched the surface with Bitcoin being introduced to the world as an asset class. It still largely needs to be introduced. So, I mean, uh, there's you know Tim Draper out there, which thinks that we're going to see an $80 trillion market cap in crypto. We're a long ways off from that. But it's going to be very speculative until we reach some more of a saturated market with crypto and, and it really starts to, to flatline and find its true price. And I think we're far from that. Absolutely. And a couple of stories here. Uh, Bank of England refuses to return 14 tons of gold to Venezuela. Uh, this happened towards the end of last year. That's something that, that really caught my eye, um, which kind of plays into the liquidity, uh, which eventually, I mean, if you, if you look at how many millionaires there are in the world, 36 million millionaires, right? Um, there's 21 million Bitcoins. So if we're looking for liquidity and you're moving forward, governments are going to get desperate. States are going to get desperate. Towns are going to get desperate. Everybody's bankrupt, right? So will there be more uh, asset forfeitures? Will there be more assets frozen? Will there be bank accounts frozen? All that kind of stuff. And if you're looking for some sort of diversification to move money quite easily from point A to point B without having to you know, get, get some blood drawn, uh, crypto still is going to play a very, very important part in this. So I, those things really, really factor into just how I'm looking uh, to see this trend and that it's still very much alive and the interest that is still involved in, in Wall Street. I mean, and I've jokingly said, once these guys have figured out how to control and corner some, corner some of this market, that's when you're going to see ETFs, which I just saw the, the Van Eck uh, ETF, um, the decision on that's delayed into, into February. Um, uh, touching on what you've mentioned on, on, on ETF. So there's still a lot of potential ahead for this and crypto is by no means going away. You know, I, I would completely agree with you. Um, the same way Coinbase really on-ramped many people into the space. I mean, you might even say Coinbase was the reason why we saw the 2017 bull market. 
um, you know, we're going to see a lot of mainstream institutional money. You have just the regular money who might want just a small one or two percent of their portfolio in some sort of non-correlated uh, growth in the crypto space, right? Or then you have the crypto only hedge funds, which are going to be out there. Um, and, you know, so much of the institutional money, the ETFs. And one thing I would say is, you know, the thing about crypto is it's still very early stage. And I know a lot of people are worried that we're going to see manipulation in crypto the way we've seen in, in maybe precious metals, uh, you know, through the derivatives market. That's That was the big worry is that if we have crypto as like a paper trade, are they going to be able to to manipulate it. And I think that's probably true down the line. But I think any sort of mainstream adoption in the near term here with this ultra low market cap is just going to add interest to the space. Maybe once we get to some sort of saturated place of, you know, a $10 trillion Bitcoin market cap, then we can talk about maybe manipulation and, and what they'll be able to do. But until we actually get to some sort of fair market value, um, where Bitcoin is, is, you know, takes on all of those network effects that Trace Mayer talks about, I think we're far from, you know, the worry of the mainstream manipulating Bitcoin, at least in the short term here. Other trends playing into 2019, what are some of the things that you're excited about? Um, we've mentioned, and you and I discussed previously on the show a little bit about AI. Uh, cannabis is another one that comes to mind. Any other uh, trends that you're looking at and asset classes that you're excited about? Well, you know, I, I did want to mention uh, cannabis. I mean, just in this last midterm election, we saw Michigan became the 10th state to legalize recreational cannabis use. So that means one in five states have illegal cannabis on the table. And, you know, 80 million people now live in states with recreational cannabis. I mean, that's huge for the U.S., um, still federally illegal. Obviously, Canada is now uh, fully recreational. Um, California, I mean, it's huge. They're expecting a billion dollars in tax revenue to come in from this. And, you know, what, what I'm excited about is specifically with cannabis is that, you know, if we see this, you know, continue to, to le be legalized and that's an opportunity for businesses to come online and on ramp many of the opportunities um, for companies to study this because it's understudied in so many ways. Uh, it's kind of like a taboo topic and it's a superior vice. This is what I tell people, you know, I, I, I'm not hell bent on why this, this should be legal or illegal. Um, I just think the government should be out of our lives in as much as and as many ways as possible. But, you know, these same people that are against cannabis are fine with alcohol and cigarettes. But the fact is, is cannabis is a, is a superior vice to even these two things. Uh, those other two things don't really have any health benefits at all. Cannabis has health benefits and it's not hurting anybody. So that's the, that's the dichotomy that we have here with cannabis. It's, it's uh, no way, no reason why it should be next to mar uh, heroin and, and cocaine uh, as a Schedule One drug. I mean, I think the opportunities here are absolutely huge. As for other trends, look, um, we're hitting the ground running here with precious metals. Gold, take a look at gold. We're now above 1290. You know, we're seeing a massive sea change with stocks right now. This is, you know, something that I think we're in the early stages of a tipping point, a tipping point with what's going to happen with stocks and uh, an upward inflection point that we're seeing in precious metals right now. And we actually covered first mining gold as our first company we uh, wanted to cover in uh, January of 2019. I think 2019 is going to be the year for gold. Uh, gold is going to have to prove itself. We're going to have to see it go beyond 1350 uh, with some decisive moves, you know, into 1400, into 1500 for really the community to start to believe in it once again. Now, I have this belief, but, you know, gold has a, a nature of, of burning us, you know, 2016, right, you know, went up to uh, 1350. We thought we were in this really solidified, confirmable market for gold to go back down again, you know, below 1200. 
uh, and then now we're starting to trickle back up again. So um, I believe that we are seeing this confirmation of a gold bull market. And one of the things that I'd point you to is, you know, last week we saw gold, uh, you know, go up on a day that stocks were actually up. You know, so it was kind of like a real, you know, breakaway from what we've always seen, which is, you know, stocks are down, gold is up maybe, or gold is down, stocks are up, you know, but I feel like these, these little cap bounces that we're seeing in the stocks uh, are indicative of, you know, the fact that we are in a downtrend and gold is sensing it. So even on the days that stocks are up, gold is still going up you know, really solidifying a confirmed bull market that we're seeing in gold, which is, has me really excited. I think we're in the early stages of a bull market here in gold. And uh, I would encourage anyone listening to this to really pay attention because 2019 could be the year, you know, we make fortunes in gold and, and I'm excited about that. Fantastic. Kenneth, uh, any final thoughts uh, before uh, we sign off? And where can my listeners learn more about you? Where can they follow you and get uh, hold of all of the wonderful information that you offer? A absolutely. And first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of what we talked about today would be best summarized at uh, crushthestreet.com forward slash dead. And then we really go over the dollar on this report here. And that's the, the underlying issues that I see happening over the next coming years to be mostly concentrated around. So um, I would encourage people to go read that report. It's free. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I have a YouTube channel where I do interviews similar to this. Uh, I know you've been on my show and you know we have a good time over there at crushthestreet.com. So if you like this content, please visit us at uh, crushthestreet.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for connecting and coming back on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge. And as always, providing so much value for my listeners. Have a fantastic 2019. All right. Thank you, sir. And, and you as well. MC Lobshire, the creator and host of the Cashflow Ninja and president of Producers Wealth. And I'm on a mission to help you achieve economic and financial freedom as quickly as possible. I achieve this by integrating the infinite banking concept with real estate investments to increase your efficiency and returns and recapture cash flow that you're not even aware of that you're losing. I share the number one strategy for investors in my holistic wealth creation course at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. Thank you for joining me again on the Cashflow Ninja. Thank you for all your support. You rock. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes and share our show with family, friends, and your network. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can sign up for our newsletter at CashflowNinja.com or text Cashflow Ninja to 44222. I'm also posting daily videos on Facebook and YouTube and will live stream weekly starting May 2018. To make sure you don't miss any of the live streams, please like and subscribe to my Facebook and YouTube platforms. I'm also dropping content on Instagram daily. Be sure to follow us on Instagram to get in on the action. I want to thank you for spending your most precious resource with me today, your time. That's our show for today. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, 
situation and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.